Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Marie Kleiner. I'm uh, chairman of the planning board and and also uh, working on the uh, master plan committee. Uh, with me tonight, um, we have for the first time, if you've been here before, our planner, Gil Hilario. Say hi, Gil. <laughs> um, if the rest, other members of the committee could introduce themselves, please. Bill and Lyle. Yeah, I'm Lyle Perney. I'm the uh, housing and economic development coordinator as well as a member of the committee. Uh, Bill Blaze. Uh, I'm also a member of the planning board in North Attleboro. And from Serpit, if you two folks want to introduce yourselves, because we'll be, I'll pass it off to you in a minute. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Taylor Perez. I'm a senior comprehensive planner and community engagement specialist at Serpit. And I am Robert Cabral, and I'm also working with Taylor at Serpit. Robert is a new addition to our team. We're very excited to have him. He is excellent. Um, so thanks for jumping on and you know, getting on the ship with us, Robert. Excited to be here. For sure. Does anybody else want to introduce themselves or just hang in and make comments later? Friendly waves. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Friendly wave, okay. <laughs> we love okay. it. Okay, it's all yours, Taylor and Rob. All right, let me do some swapping of my screens, get everything kind of situated. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Excellent. Well, again, thank you all for being here. Um, we're very excited to be talking about housing. Um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about here. And uh, we love working with the town. They're a great, great group of people. So just all around, really happy to be here. This is, um, this is our second workshop on housing. We did have one back in May um, that was looking at the needs assessment for the housing production plan. So. We'll kind of do a quick recap. Uh, Robert will help me with that. And then we'll go into the kind of meat of our presentation, which is talking about barriers to housing development uh, goals and strategies. And so just a couple of quick logistics. Obviously, you all know we're recording. Um, if you need anyone you know, who wants to reference this at a later point, uh, it, it'll be on YouTube. We'll put it on the town website. And um, Lyle, I'm not sure, but I think it might. Is it going to do a North TV uh, situation or no? Unconfirmed? Uh, yes, it is. It'll Excellent. be on. Uh, it's it's not live, but it'll be on subsequent right. to this. Yeah. So if you want to watch on there, it'll be there too. Uh, again, I have a couple quick kind of bullet points here. We encourage folks to take notes uh, and to write down their questions. We have a lot to present here. So what we'd like to do is ideally take all the questions at the end of the presentation. And that'll serve as a nice segue into our discussion. Uh, so again, just write those down. It could be on your phone, could be on a piece of paper, whatever works for you. Uh, it'll just be really easier for us. Um, we do encourage folks to kind of just be muted during the presentation. I get <laughs> very easily distracted. Um, so as you can probably already see based on our just basic conversations, it's just easier for me if I don't hear any background noise and probably also for folks who are trying to um, take notes or actively listen, it just makes everything easier. When we do the discussion, um, we encourage folks to use the raise hand feature. Uh, I cannot show you now, but if you, or maybe you can, I don't think you can see it, but if you scroll down uh, to your kind of panel, the little dock at the bottom of Zoom, there's a reactions button. And within there, there should be a raise hand, uh, raise hand feature. So you can raise your hand um, and then we can try and go in an orderly fashion when we like do the discussion. Um, you do have to put your hand down. Uh, I think we can also do it, so we might do that for you if you've already had your question answered, just to keep track of the most like up-to-date folks who would like to speak. So that's all the logistics on my end. Um, I'm just gonna get right into it and we'll just kind of go from there. And so if you were at the first workshop, this is a bit of a refresher. Um, we're just gonna talk quickly about what a housing production plan is and why we're doing it. Uh, so a housing production plan is a five-year plan, and we refer to it as a community's proactive strategy for planning and developing affordable housing. Uh, we try and do this with opportunities for both residents and stakeholders to not only become informed on the process, but to actively participate and help us create the plan. Um, we use these to assist communities to plan for low and moderate income residents, and the whole end goal is to provide a diverse housing supply to create fair, safe, uh, equitable opportunities for all residents to obtain housing. 
And so there are different sections that are required for HPP to be considered in HPP and not just a basic housing plan. Um, one that we discussed earlier was the housing needs assessment, which looks at demographics, the condition of the housing stock, including its age, um, future populations and you know, potential housing needs as populations age. And we also identify development constraints, uh, barriers as we call them, that might limit development. Um, and so the first workshop we had kind of presented what we found during the needs assessment and then we heard feedback. And from there we developed these constraints which we will be presenting tonight. And again, the kind of meat of tonight is the two exciting things and the, the more positively oriented things, uh, our goals and our strategies. Um, the goals are just that, housing goals uh, that are addressing the needs of the community and that are providing a range of housing types, you know, rental, home ownership, and to a diverse set of folks. And then after we present the goals, we're gonna go on to the strategies. How do we accomplish these goals? Um, it's very straightforward, it's just like, a list of strategies and that hopefully will help us get to where we want to be in the end. So a couple key terms that are important um, as we have this conversation for folks who might not be kind of deep in the housing world. Um, we're going to talk about three things here and two of these most likely will be discussed a lot tonight. Um, the first will be naturally occurring affordable housing and we're also going to talk about what subsidized affordable housing is and then we're going to do a little exercise uh, describing cost burden and what it means to be cost burdened. So let's begin with the naturally occurring affordable housing. We use air quotes. Um, it's not necessarily a technical term, but it is a concept that we use. And it essentially describes housing uh, that's available without subsidies and at lower price points. Um, and the reason those housing opportunities exist is because the right regulatory and market conditions exist for it to be in existence. Uh, it doesn't mean subsidized, like we said, but it's built upon the idea of not being cost burdened. Um, and when we talk about cost burden, we're describing if a household is paying 30% or more of their gross annual household income on basic living costs. And when we say basic living costs, we mean mortgage or rent and utilities. And so when you think about naturally occurring affordable housing, think about housing that's affordable to a young family um, or to a recent high school or college graduate, someone who works on an hourly wage um, or an older couple who might be on a fixed income. And think about visually starter homes, so smaller homes, um, homes that are good for older couples to downsize and apartments that a recent graduate could afford among many other options. And so that's naturally occurring. And what is subsidized affordable housing? This is a little bit more technical, um, but it is just that, housing that's subsidized. It's subsidized by a public agency, a nonprofit, or a limited dividend company. Um, it always has a deed restriction. So its availability is restricted to certain populations uh, and always restricted at incomes at or below 80% of the area median income, or AMI. And so area median income is a description of the median income for a certain geographic region. It's not town specific. Uh, it's a area that HUD determines and uses kind of consistently. And if you're curious about what goes into the area median income in terms of locations for North Attleboro, they are right here. Um, but as of fiscal year 21, the area median income for North Attleboro for a family of four, it's determined by household size, was $86,500. And that means that if you're any household of four that's making at or less than $69,200, which is 80% of the median, the area median income, you're qualified to apply for subsidized affordable housing. And so the Commonwealth does require that all municipalities have at least 10% of their housing stock to be subsidized affordable housing. Um, and a little note here, just to kind of explain what exactly goes into being considered subsidized affordable housing. Um, for a unit to be counted in a municipality's inventory, the developed needs to receive an endorsement by a state or a federal housing program, uh, think mass housing, DHCD, mass development, and it needs to go through Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A slash R. Uh, and the units need to have a use restriction, aka deed restriction for at least 30 years, and they need a marketing plan. So that's kind of what makes up what goes into subsidized affordable housing, what it is and how it's counted. And so let's do a quick uh, example here of cost burden. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, and we're just going to use the median income for the town, not the area. And so North Attleboro's median income in 2019 was approximately $93,000. And so let's make an assumption. You're a household of four. You make that much. 
And let's assume that you are spending 30% of your annual income on basic living costs. And so what is that number? 30% of your annual income, if you made 93,000 in a year, would be $27,900. And so if all that money is going towards a mortgage payment or rent, how much are you spending monthly? And this is how I like to think of cost burden on a monthly basis because most bills occur on a monthly basis. And so let's take that number and divide it by 12 and you get $2,325. And so that means if you're a household of four making $93,000, uh, if you're paying anything at $2,325 or more per month, you are considered cost burdened. Um, and if you wanted to try this exercise for yourself, you would take the sum of everyone who contributes to your monthly bills in your house. You would sum their gross, not their net, their gross annual income. You would multiply that by 0.3 to get that 30% minimum to be considered cost burdened. Then you divide that by 12. So you get your minimum monthly payment to be considered cost burdened. Um, and I think it's a good exercise. Robert and I recently did it and we were like, oh, <laughs> um, to really illustrate, like you don't have to be low or moderate income to, to be considered cost burden. You can still have a substantial income, but you can have a deficit between how much you make and how costly it is to live. Um, so that's what we're trying to get at when we talk about naturally occurring affordable housing and whether or not you are cost burdened. And so I'm going to kick it to Robert, uh, if you're comfortable with that, he's going to tell us about kind of what you've told us through past workshops, uh, you know, what we know from that, and then what the data is showing us. Uh, so Robert, all you. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. So yeah, as, as I just mentioned, we're gonna talk about barriers and needs for affordable housing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the basis of that is, yeah, what we covered in the last meeting. So we built off of that and we're presenting a little bit here. So the graph here to start our overview is a demographic profile of the town. And um, what we're looking at here is North Attleboro in the pie charts has an aging population. You can see that nearly 20% of North Attleboro's population is 60 or older of age. And this has increased since 2010. Uh, and you know, when we talk about that certain types of housing, we can get into this later on. Um, for example, smaller homes can help with the need of an aging population. Um, but first we wanna highlight your preferences for housing in town. So during this work, the last workshop, we conducted a survey to get your feedback. Um, we very much appreciate everyone that took the time to share their preferences. And on the screen here, we can see the results of that survey. So in answering the survey, two out of three respondents want to see more single family homes. One out of three want to see more duplexes, townhouses, or condos. One out of five would like to see smaller multifamily apartments. Uh, that's like up to eight units, as well as more assisted living facilities. One out of 10 want to see larger apartment buildings with eight or more units. And lastly, one out of 10 would like to see things like accessory dwelling units. And that provides an additional living quarters that's independent of the primary dwelling unit. It could be detached or detached, uh, but it has a different entrance. So next, we had a question to ask respondents uh, uh, if they feel there's sufficient affordable housing in North Attleboro. And the majority of respondents feel that there's not or they're not sure. 41% of respondents felt that there is, and a smaller percent did not answer the question. So in addition to these survey questions to gauge your preferences, we looked at financial and demographic data for the town and also the region. Uh, the first of that outline is here. Statistically, there's uh, nearly one in four homeowners and one in three renters uh, are cost burdened. And that's the concept that Taylor was talking about a little bit earlier. And in addition to the 30% uh, marker that Taylor mentioned, this chart shows severely cost burden, which is the same, but it's individuals who pay more than 50% of their income for housing, individuals or families who pay more than 50% of their income for housing. Uh, and locations with expensive housing, as Taylor mentioned, often increased cost burden on those who live in that same community. And this next chart shows that uh, North Attleboro is a desirable place to live in Bristol County too. And for both the growth uh, in the cost of homes has outpaced the increase in the town's median household income since 2011. And, um, and then kind of, to jump to the affordable part, uh, subsidized to ameliorate the stress on individuals and families. The state does require that a minimum of 10% of the community's housing be listed in the subsidized housing inventory, as Taylor mentioned. Currently, we can see in the graph that the North, uh, North Attleboro subsidized housing lags behind nearby communities if you compare the red circles there. But it's an opportunity for growth. And um, this is a good segue, uh, as Taylor mentioned too, to jump into factors that contribute to a housing production plan uh, contributed barriers for housing production plans. So these needs outline 
what we're next going to get into, which is barriers. And these barriers are challenges that limit development opportunities to affordable housing. And these exist really in all communities. And we'll just run through that list really quick here. The first one we have is restrictive zoning regulations. And these prohibit higher density uses um, and often lead to unsustainable development. We have a lack of public utilities, which exists in parts of North Attleboro. And these typically are barriers because they increase the cost of development, particularly for non-single family home construction. Uh, we have lack of staff capacity experience, which is common in a lot of communities, especially smaller communities like North Attleboro. And um, another barrier is public perceptions regarding affordable housing, which can be negative and inaccurate at times. Um, we have high cost environments, which highlight how desirable a place can be to live, but at the same time, they create challenges for providing affordable housing in that area. And last, we have a lack of adequate transportation options. And these create problems for individuals who don't have a car or have access to a car. Now, why do we mention these barriers and the needs? So we mentioned the needs and barriers to inform our discussion about housing goals and strategies. Uh, so I'm gonna give it back to Taylor and she's gonna walk us through this next portion of the housing production plan. For sure, thank you, Robert. Um, this is the fun part, I think. Uh, I'm excited to go through this with everyone. We worked with the town and um, with the master plan committee as well to help develop these goals uh, and the, the subsequent strategies. So we have five goals uh, and these are kind of helping us, you know, when we're thinking about these, like we're thinking about housing outcomes that we wish to see and what do we need to do to get there. And so we'll run through these quickly. None of this is in any order, by the way, this is just the way they're listed. Um, we will kind of determine priority based on our conversation tonight. Uh, the first goal is to build internal capacity to discuss and review affordable housing proposals and acquisitions, help folks in town speak the language uh, and feel empowered to help make those decisions. We want to produce starter homes and that naturally occurring affordable housing we discussed earlier. We want to produce housing options for older adults to support aging in place. We want to produce housing options for adults with disabilities and mental illnesses. Uh, again, everyone deserves fair housing opportunities and safe, affordable housing. So we're, that's what we're trying to get out with all of these. And lastly, kind of the generic one that every housing production plan gets for a town that's under 10%. We want to continue to produce those SHI eligible units to get to 10%. And so those are our five goals. And now we ask ourselves, great, how do we get it done? Uh, and so we have our strategies here. We have 10 strategies to complement these five goals. Uh, again, no particular order. Let's just run through them. First one that we have listed here is the pursuit of friendly 40Bs and or developers with the intent to produce affordable housing. Um, again, when you have a developer who is willing to work with you, that is very valuable and it creates a nice symbiotic relationship between the two of you and helps accomplish your goals quicker. Uh, we have strategic zoning amendments that could be through the creation of overlay districts or just amendments to the base zoning. Uh, again, to kind of you know, encourage mixed use development, maybe higher density uses in areas deemed appropriate, et cetera. We want to encourage leadership training to increase that staff knowledge capacity, fluency in the housing language. Um, we encourage the town to pursue professional support to assist in implementing the housing production plan where necessary. Could be through folks like us at SERPED, it could be through nonprofits, um, you know, consultants in general. Um, we encourage an affordable housing outreach and education campaign, which again kind of helps to dispel any lingering myths regarding affordable housing and not only educates but empowers the community to be enthusiastic and, uh, you know, participate in the conversation meaningfully about affordable housing. We encourage the investigation of opportunities for adaptive reuse which uh, is the idea of redeveloping underutilized municipally owned lands and buildings uh, for, for affordable housing. We encourage also to work in tandem with adaptive reuse goals, uh, reviewing the availability of town owned and tax title properties. Um, we encourage the town to establish a first time home buyers program to assist first time buyers with navigating the market and purchasing of a home, especially in today's market. It's quite competitive in Massachusetts still. We encourage providing direct assistance to help preserve housing for vulnerable communities, including senior residents. This could be adding a, a first floor bathroom in a two, two story home. It could be also removing hazardous materials for folks who may not be able to afford to do so on their own. And lastly, we encourage the creation of design guidelines for duplexes and large developments to ensure that these large developments that we might need to see uh, fit within the local community, feel right. We pass by them and we say, that looks good. Um, and so these are our 10 strategies. 
we're almost at the end. <laughs> we're going to quickly run through this kind of uh, diagram that Robert drew up for us, which is excellent. Um, this just kind of explains visually what some of the different strategies we're discussing today are. So a zoning overlay bylaw, you know, and that strategic zoning amendments affects a certain region or area in town. Um, it's used to guide development and, you know, developers can choose to follow the existing zoning or the overlay, and it can have those dimensional scale design standards, etc. The targeted development kind of gets at pursuing uh, developers who wish to work with the town. It's a project by project situation, and it helps if it's best pursued cooperatively between both the community and the developer. Excuse me. Lastly, the adaptive reuse is similar to targeted development uh, in that we're looking at certain parcels of land that may um, be suitable to be redeveloped, but in some instances they may require um, rezoning and it might be difficult to find eligible sites or appropriate funding, um, but it's still a good strategy to pursue in the event that there is a very suitable parcel. And we just want to make a quick note here. These are not mutually exclusive. Um, they all should occur at the same time. Again, priorities can be set, but um, you know, these can all be happening in tandem with one another. Last, last section. Um, I want to prime folks kind of minds visually for what we're discussing when we talk about affordable housing and what we talk about when we you know, talk about design guidelines, different uh, looks and feels of developments. And what I want you to think about is what resonates with you when you look at things like this, can you envision them in town? Where? Uh, and if, you, if you're not liking it, why? Tell, we'd like to know, like, you know, would you change something and would that make it better? Uh, or is it just a no-go? And so think about all of that as we kind of go through this. Um, we'll start here. And we're going from smallest to largest in terms of scale. So we have Oakley Corner. Uh, this is the smallest one we have here. It's four attached townhouses in Belmont. And again, like, you know, you could do several of these in a subdivision if you wanted or on a parcel that may be ripe for uh, redevelopment. Getting a little bit larger and again, talking more about like a new subdivision, uh, 11 single family homes, Village Hill. This is in Northampton. So imagine, you know, smaller setbacks from the sidewalk. Uh, we're not seeing driveways, uh, you know, smaller homes, but very cute, very, very uh, nice looking. Getting larger, uh, we might be talking more about something that could occur in downtown here. Uh, 30 Haven, this is at 30 Haven Street in Reading. This is 53 condo units. And again, you're starting to see that mixed use component on the first floor and residential on top. Local example, we love it. Uh, Renaissance Station North in Attleboro. This is 80 apartment units. I believe this is also a mixed use situation. Um, I haven't looked when I've drove by recently, but correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is. Another local, one Mansfield in Mansfield, <laughs> uh, 81 apartment units built in 2016. Again, that mixed use component and residential on top. Then we have another local example, recently completed like maybe four months ago, uh, one Wall Street in Attleboro. This is part of their TOD district. Uh, this is 136 apartment units. I also think this has a mixed use component, but I am unsure. Lastly, bi uh, biggest example we have tonight in neighboring Plainville, uh, the Oasis at Plainville, which is 240 apartment units. And so imagine maybe seven or eight of these in a complex development style. And so we can go back and reference these throughout the conversation. I just wanted to prime folks uh, to visually see it before we kind of begin. And so unless I have missed anything, I think we can open for questions. One point I do want to make is I'm going to share this story map in the chat uh, so folks can access it. There is a comment card right here. We encourage if you, you know, think of something later, maybe you don't feel comfortable saying it now, um, whatever the case may be, you can submit your comments here. You don't need to provide your name or your email if you don't want to. It can be anonymous, but we do encourage you to share your comments. So I will do that now. Um, and again, unless Robert, I've missed anything or Marie or anyone, um, we can start opening for questions and discussion. Taylor, I think you mentioned this, but I, uh, just to emphasize, those examples we looked at are, um, they ha all have an affordable component. So mm -hmm. these are examples of affordable housing, um, subsidized affordable housing. The only one I'm actually, just to be um, frank about that I'm unsure about is One Wall Street. Um, I know Renaissance mm -hmm. Station in that area does. One Wall Street, I'm unsure. But again, when we're talking about scale, that's kind of just the idea. But Robert's yeah. correct, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that everything in Attleboro has an affordable component. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, they, they have a huge need for affordable housing over there. Right. 
yeah, they have such a large housing stock, have to kind of keep up with it. Um, and so, yeah, do folks have any questions about any of the material we presented? Stephen, yeah. So uh, I apologize. I'm always the guy with the questions. <laughs> um, just uh, it's more of a, um, well, 21 East Street uh, here in North Attleboro looks very familiar to one of those complexes. Um, I, I was actually fascinated with several of these developments. Uh, the thing that I found striking is that um, we're so we're only at like under four mm -hmm. uh, percent. I, I found that uh, you know I apologize. That this is not something I'm really involved in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was glad I was you know informed of this meeting. But like, uh, is it would something like Twenty One East Street be considered any of that part, Lyle, or or, or anyone who might be able to answer that? Um, so that's not the case by the shaking of the head. So um, that that's obviously pretty interesting to me that um, you know we have these developments being put in. And that, that that component's not, and that's not on us. I think that's on the developer, obviously. But I, I just found it very really striking that we're only we're under four. That I guess it's a, more of a comment than a uh, than mm -hmm. a question. Yeah, but yeah. A very I, great great presentation, by the way. Very informative to a layman like myself. If I could, for developments going forward, uh, especially multifamily units, we're strongly suggesting, quote unquote, that there be an affordable component to all of them. So it's, you know, there's nothing we can do about the past, but going forward, you know, for all the uh, multifamily, especially multifamily rentals, we're, uh, quote, strongly encouraging, unquote, affordable. Yeah, and Lyle, I've heard you t bring it up for two years now uh, in every meeting I've been with you. And uh, certainly, uh, again, being uh, an, a novice or a layman to this, um, but I know like even some of the things you were talking about and certainly don't want to speak out of school, but some of the projects that you've been referring to uh, local uh, in some, you know, not to get too specific, but areas in town. Uh, I don't know if you want to expand on any, any of those conversations, but uh, it sounds like you do have, we do have some type of plan, but getting it up the, the, I guess, getting the can not kicked and starting to actually do something with the can is the, is, is the next step. Mm -hmm. Well, if, yeah, I can speak a little bit since uh, Mike Borg has talked in public about the mall and what we're trying to do there. We're working with a developer to uh, acquire the old Sears building and convert it to uh, about 200 housing unit, rental units. And we have an agreement with the developer involved that those units would be affordable. Firstly, secondly, um, we just got a, it hasn't been announced yet, but you know, you're hearing it first here. We uh, got a grant from DHCD to um, study running a sewer line to the Curtoy site, which is on Menden Road in the Southwest corner of the, of the town. Um, if, if in fact we can either it's a 72 acre site that's been abandoned since 1988 and we've we've gotten a million dollars worth of grants so far to do something with from various granting agencies to do something with that space but you know we we strongly desire to put 55 or 60 um probably cottage homes in there mm -hmm. and uh, there would be at least a 25 percent component that would be affordable, which means the entire development would count. So th those are two things that come to mind. And as developers come to us talking about housing in other places, we're making it clear at the outset that there needs to be an affordable component to all of them. So I'll just add uh, a little bit to that. Uh, Lyle and Steve is, uh, you know, 21 East Street is the past. I think in the future, as Lyle mentioned, uh, we'll have to, it's, it's our job as staff to negotiate the affordability components. So throughout the permitting process, I think planning could, uh, or the plan area and Lyle and I could try to encourage affordability in, in density, perhaps, you know, one for every 10 market rate to be affordable. And uh, so we will be doing that in the future. We will be trying to work with developers more uh, to try to get some affordability uh, in the future projects. It, it, it's very difficult to do in a large single family development. Um, you know, the, 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 until recently, what's been encouraged in town is large acreage 
uh, large single family homes. Um, but that's changing for lots of reasons, mainly because there's no, there's no affordable place, not only in North Attleboro, but realistically any place else in the state for people to live. And we're in the dilemma of trying to create factories and businesses and jobs and you know, people can't commute from Kentucky every day to work. They, they can't afford to live here. So, you know, we're, we're trying to solve that problem. Maria, I know you have your hand raised, go, go for it. Oh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to give a little perspective of, of how we got to what we're doing today. Um, it actually goes back a couple of years ago. Um, Lyle and I were discussing the fact that the town did not have a housing production plan so um, in terms of, of 40B uh, proposals, we were, you know, the town was in a position where we um, really didn't have that much expertise involved with uh, affordable housing or all of the different options available. I'll be honest, the first thing I wrote down for a question was how do we build that internal capacity and, and you know, the, the strategies were to have professional development support and leadership training. Lyle and I uh, went over to Serpid and asked about housing production plans, um, and that's how eventually we came to um, doing both the update to the master plan and the uh, housing production plan that we're engaged in now. We, we were able um, and very fortunate to get some grants to help the town to do that, but I think that, I don't know about, I can't speak for Lyle, but I know certainly for me, I have learned a lot about housing um, and about all the terms to do with it, and certainly I think it's not so much that the town has avoided trying to do it. I don't think that um, we necessarily have had um, the expertise to proceed with it. And I think we're working pretty hard um, at acquiring that and, and putting together a plan as to what we do. I know I, I've had a lot of people tell me that they would prefer different types of um, approaches to it. Um, my sense is going to be is to be honest, that I think we're going to have to have a combination of things. Um, it may well be, you know, we pick up a few um, interests in having complexes, maybe not as big as Station One or Wall Street or whatever, but or even Twenty One East Street, because there aren't aren't that many places that one would locate those. And and quite honestly, people still in North Attleboro still are interested in a single family home on a fairly large piece of property. And I think we need to take a look at, uh, you know, Oakley Corner is on the uh, the screen now. I think something like this or even a series of, of um, uh, ones like that would make a big difference in terms of being able to raise our numbers. I don't think you have to go, you know, to a complex with 200 apartments in it and 50 of them are, are affordable in order to um, get there um, as quickly as we might like to. But I think it's important that we recognize that the town's really making an effort um, with the assistance of Serpid to put a plan in place, to have some strategies. And, and as Gil said, you know, we can't look at the past, we have to look forward. Uh, but I think we, you know, for me, because I've learned a lot about housing, I think we have to uh, continue to try and learn and grow and make sure that all the people that are involved in um, attracting developers to town and then permitting them once they decide to uh, do something like this, um, understand how all of that can happen. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, for the best, you know, to come out of this and, and I'm really looking forward to the strategies that we decide upon and that we um, pursue pretty quickly. Yeah, if you look okay, at I'm the, done. <laughs> if you look at the picture that's up now and multiply that house times fifty five that's what you know I, I for one envision for the Kurt toy site mm -hmm. uh, firstly secondly with specific regard to housing, I was hired to do economic development, and the only reason I took on housing was because the state is organized under one secretary who has housing and economic development, and I thought it'd be easier to have all that together in one place here, easier to get grants. So that's worked out, but you know, I am, you know, 10 years ago at this time, I was selling semiconductors. So this, this is not my sweet spot. For sure. I'm gonna make one point and then I'm gonna kick it back to Steve who has his, uh, his hand raised. We, 
we were talking about kind of getting to 10%, right? And um, there's a couple things to note there and for the town to consider going forward. Um, every 10 years, your your numbers for your subsidized housing inventory are recalculated. Um, they're, they're fixed for that 10 years too, so they're locked in. Um, and they're based on your census number of households um, or, or units in town, I believe, whatever the actual number is. Uh, and we're due to get those numbers soon. Um, and so depending on how much development has occurred in town, the 3% that you're seeing right now it, it may even decrease. Um, I don't, how substantially we're unsure really, again, just depends on how active development has been in the last 10 years, but it is just something to note. Uh, another point that we want to speak on here is just that um, one of the big kind of, I guess, incentives of a housing production plan is that there's kind of a process to get to what you call certified. Um, and that's kind of the end goal. And when you certify a housing production plan, essentially you are showing um, that you are actively producing affordable housing units and they're at very small percentages. And so I believe Robert, correct me, or Gil or whomever, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's 0.5%, you get one year to, um, if you wanted to deny comprehensive permits under chapter 40B. So if you had a development that was coming in uh, that you just did not think fit with the character and didn't seem to suit the town, um, so long as you had proved that you were going to produce at least 0.5% of your housing stock uh, in subsidized affordable units, you can deny that. And up to 1%, you get two years. Um, and that's kind of, again, you get that two year window if you are showing that production is happening. And so to speak to Marie's point, if smaller development styles like Village Hill, um, like Oakley Corner, speak to you, if you can get them to occur at around 50 or 60 units, which I believe is 0.5% for Adel uh, North Attleboro as of right now, that again might change in 2020, like when we get the 2020 numbers, um, that, that kind of gives you that, you know, that window of time to think more critically and thoughtfully about large developments that may be coming into town. So I just want to make that point. Um, Gil, I see you muting and I'm muting, so I'm going to kick it to you quick and then just... No, no, sorry. I just want to... I think you mean, uh, based on the census, the percentage it can actually decrease. So from 3%, right. it can actually decrease. So right. it's a moving target. It's important to continually mm -hmm. add a little bit every year so mm -hmm. we can remain um, you know, at the stable level of above 10%. Right, right, exactly. Uh, Stephen, what's up? So just a couple of comments. First of all, um, I I'm really impressed over the last couple of years. I know this has been a huge topic in North Attleboro. Mm -hmm. um, so I commend the people, particularly Marie, who, you know, I've known for 20 years. But the thing that I find fascinating, even more so, is, and, and Marie, being an educator and uh, all the things that you're involved in, I'm shocked that the number isn't higher based on the need in our community um, because we have so many children or so many families, I should say, that are on free or reduced lunch and free and reduced breakfast. I know that was a big state thing because of COVID, but we were in that threshold even before COVID. Uh, I'm just, I'm just really shocked that the number is as high uh, in the sense of, you know, I think the medium um, household was something over, you know, close to a hundred thousand dollars. And uh, I, I, I just think that I don't want to say the numbers are skewed, but I, I really think that there are a lot more people that are in that quote unquote under 4% uh, that percentage for low income. I really think that there's a lot more and that's not my anything more than seeing the dynamics of our town that have changed drastically over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, I just see a lot more families in need. So I, I only throw that out there as an, obviously I'm, I love the village Hill um, per, the project, I think that would be a huge addition to our community. And like I envision like the little playground in that parking lot area, you know, so that the kids have a community area if there are children in those types of settings, but, but uh, extremely informative, informative. And as always, Serpid, this is probably the fifth thing that I've been involved with you guys. You guys always kill it. So thank you. In, in fairness to the town, I would say that unless somebody in government is responsible for it, nothing's going to happen. And, you know, responsibility for this and economic development. I'm not trying to blow my own horn, but it's only been, it, it's, it's been less than three years. So, you know, one, one leads to the other. 
So while we're having this discussion, I'm pulling up this uh, this mapping exercise that we've done in the past at some of our master plan workshops. Marie, what's up? I see your hands raised. I was I was just going to respond to to Steve for a second and and say that you know that's why I was gently trying to say that I I don't I don't really know that it will I can't speak to anything before I was on the planning board so I can't tell you why or why not you know they didn't encourage you know just a portion of a of a subdivision be affordable I have no idea why any of that didn't happen I Gil is absolutely right in saying that the planning board and and Gil and, and Lyle as our professional staff are really on board, I think in terms of trying to make sure that we make uh, positive growth in that. Um, and we all have, you know, slightly different opinions on, on how things can make that way. When, when Steve, when you were just commenting on the village way um, and Lyle was saying that he could see that at the Couture's property, actually I see it more as a mixture of the one with the townhouses and the, um, the homes in Village Way, different sections. I mentioned at a meeting we were at one time that they did one section that was geared towards uh, young families and had the playground and the trails and the little park and so forth. And then another section was uh, uh, for um, people with older children or whatever. And then you could have another section that was uh, one level living for, for senior um, uh, people who were looking for a new place to live to downsize. So, you know, I think we need to take a look at um, once we have an idea of what can and might happen with the Quatoys property and some of the other properties, um, how can we make some combination of all of these things uh, provide more um, housing? And I know what Steve's talking about with the kids. Uh, yes, I have been retired a few years, but, you know, I know that we still have families with children living in the motels in North Attleboro. I know that we have homeless people in North Attleboro. And, you know, it's an issue that we can't ignore. We have to pay attention to it. And like I said, make a plan and move forward. You know, just Taylor mentioned it in her presentation. Um, there's a perception of affordable housing with, and Dan, I'm not trying, I'm not going to say anything disparaging, but some people who aren't educated properly on what affordable housing really means confuse affordable housing with public housing. And unless there's a, a, a very proactive um, explanation campaign, a marketing campaign to explain everything about affordable housing, I think it's, it's very easy for people to say, well, we don't need any more of that. We're not going to have that all over town. So, you know, that's the end of the subject. Um, and there are companies in um, in the state, Chapa specifically, who puts together professional presentations on explaining exactly what affordable housing is and its, its need in all communities, <clears throat> including ours, and that it, it, it goes much beyond public housing. Yeah, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I do want to support uh, Lyle's observation of the difference between affordable housing uh, and public housing. Uh, there, there are very different uh, residents. Um, so that the teachers and police officers and uh, even housing directors uh, who could not afford to live here might afford to live here in one of those. And these are people who work in the town. So that being said, I really want to commend uh, Lyle and, and Gil and, and, the, and Marie, the workers of the grant. I am so encouraged to hear the sewer grant going up, up on Menden Road. That is, uh, I just see that as going to be the, the single major force to get that project moving. I, I, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, I, yeah the, the, the peddler and me tried to sell that lot three times to people who said, where's the close, closest sewer line? And that's where the conversation ended, so. Yeah. May, I, uh, may I ask a guiding question based on your comments, Lyle? Um, you were talking about the, the outreach and education. Um, I'd be curious to kind of uh, pick, pick folks' brains about exactly the best approach to doing something like that in town would be. I think there's a bunch of different ways that it could be gone about, whether it's, um, 
you know, through public meetings, whether it's through informational mailers, uh, you know, as projects are in the works, um, whether it's news articles, and not only just like, I guess, the best medium to go about that, and it could also be just thinking out loud on the uh, town website, um, but not only like the best medium to do that, but particularly what content you think would be useful in an education campaign. Um, is it stuff like what we've talked about tonight? Um, is it a little bit more, you know, what, what do we think that we need to do to help folks, um, again, kind of get back to the idea of feeling educated, enthusiastic, and empowered when it comes to having these conversations? Well, if, if, if you're asking me, I, I think that, I mean, at a higher level than responding directly to your question with, I think whatever we do, we need to be very careful to um, not be disparaging towards people who have had tough lives and you know wind up uh, in in a position where they have to live in public housing so we need to be i think discreet and gentle and kind in you know not not talking about people at the top of the heap versus people at the bottom of the heap right and again the the presentations i've seen from chapa do a good job of of explaining that professionally yeah, Marie. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm a little confused um, about what you're referring to when we use the the, the term public housing. Um, I grew up um, in New York City, and my father worked for what was originally the Federal Housing Authority, and then became Department of Housing and Urban Development. And part of his job um, involved going to visit uh, construction jobs for. Um, public housing in New York, New Jersey, and uh, Connecticut. So I grew up seeing public housing, and I never thought of public housing as anything other than places where people lived. It, it didn't mean anything to me. The first time I ever heard of it as a negative was when I was teaching in Southie, and, and, and people referred to the projects, the D Street projects, and, and other kinds of things. And it was always um, negative and, and, and derogatory. Um, so I, I, I guess that I have a, a slightly different perspective on it, but in terms of how you educate people, um, I have I'm not familiar with the chapter presentation, but I would look at it as you try and do it with the sort of ripple effect that you start with something that's fairly small and then try and then just keep expanding and expanding. And, and to me, the first thing I thought of, to be honest with you, was groups like PTOs, because to me, you need to pay attention to um, what Steve said earlier about uh, families with children having an affordable place to live. Um, and uh, I think if you used PTOs, maybe that might be a nice little starting point because it's smaller groups, um, which you could then expand to other groups. I think you'd have to do um, a, a multi-level approach because you, you're going to need to target all different kinds of audiences to make sure that they all get the same message, but they're going to go to different places. If, if I could, uh, Marie, I completely agree. I was thinking the same thing. I mean, uh, starting with these smaller groups because everyone's time, as we all know, not, uh, I mean, we're, all of us are involved in this type of profession where we're on Zoom meetings, but a lot of the clients that I work with in the park and rec world, you know, all these families, it's, they want quick hits. They want quick, like you go to, to a PTO meeting or PTA meetings, they're short, they're under an hour, you know, a leaflet passing out information, a contact website. And then from the other perspective, because obviously I look at, I try to look at everything globally, but my real focus is families and children. But certainly we have a huge population in town that is quote unquote aging out. And where can they go? You know, like a lot of them own these, half million dollar homes and they're, and they're moving on, but where, where are their, you know, they're probably, let's just say they're 60, 70 year, year, years of age, where are they going to get that information from, you know? So maybe senior centers or, you know, or retirement boards, things like that. I, but I agree, Maria, the, that smaller concept where you get the, that, that group of people together that have that same focus. And, and, and honestly, a lot of those people network. Uh, and I don't mean a lot of those people. I mean, the people that are in, you know, if you're in um, third grade, you're all, your social circle is third graders, is what I'm getting at. So when I see mm. those people, right, the demographics of the grades that they're in, but I agree, smaller groups, things like that would be my insight. 
Yeah, Brian, what's up? I don't know if I can't hear you if you do have um, audio on. Ryan. Well, let's kick it to Gil first and then Ryan um, in the last five minutes, if you get your audio on, um, let's definitely talk. And then Julia, let's bang it all out. <laughs> so uh, one thing is also important is being friendly to developers. So not just the people in town, I think making uh, you know, bylaws, zoning regulations, or perhaps even, you know, hand holding the developer to, um, you know, what it takes to develop a affordable housing project is important. So I think we also have to think about that, you know, how we can make it more friendly or to developers. Great point. Ryan, anything working over the end yet? All right, we'll kick it to Julia. Um, I, sorry, I just think this, since I work with the senior population, I think there's a real disconnect when people think of um, senior housing or, you know, subsidized housing in a place like Jules Cross, where, it's, you know, you can qualify for some affordable, more affordable housing. Uh, I think it's because people have never been inside. So some of these places we need to maybe invite the public in a little bit so they can see that they're actually, it's a nice place and it's okay. And it's, I don't know. But I, to speak to your point, when Robert and I were exploring um, development uh, like examples, I think we were looking at some of the websites, like including Renaissance Station um, and the Oasis, and they're they're very nice. Like <laughs> right, right. But when you say subsidized housing or or you know public housing, people get a negative opinion, right? right. Because well, some of them just do. Right. And but when you go in, you're like, hey, this is great. It has a playground, a place for their bicycles, and it's actually affordable and nice and an asset to our community. Um, and I, I don't think that always gets across, but I think maybe if the public was, you know, able to actually view it with their own eyes more often, even if it was, you know, a, a, a video on, t you know, a video that they could see, oh, this is great. It's nice. I would like living there. Right. And some seniors are afraid when you say you can move to senior housing. They're afraid. They're like, oh no. So I think we need Sorry. to make it less scary, less scary and more appealing. More, it, it, it's already appealing, some of it, but they just need to know that it's appealing. Stephen, what's Sorry. that? So if I could interject again, and uh, this is a personal note. I actually, I live in Lincoln and uh, I live on a little, Little, sub, little subdivision street and right across the street from me is Lincoln Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, been, I've been here 25 years and my mom actually lives in this housing authority. And I can tell you, you know, it's a great point that uh, Julia, I believe, just brought up. Uh, it, I am amazed at what my mother gets, um, you know, in the facility. It's, ama it's, it's beautiful grounds, it's well kept, it's a, it's a safe environment. You know, the light bulb gets broken, someone's there to fix it. You know, all of these great things that, uh, you know, I could speak pers firsthand from a personal perspective. It's probably the greatest thing I ever did to get my mom in there. She was living in a home that she couldn't, you know, keep up. It was it, it becoming too much. And by the grace of God, she got into that housing authority. And it's been, it's been a, like, you know, with, like, with a poster child of, you know, someone who lost a spouse and now has a wonderful place to live. It, it's an incredible place. And I know some of them, unfortunately, because of funding may not be as well kept up, but I know a lot of them are, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I agree that, uh, you know, getting that message out there of what those things really are, because it's, it's been a huge, huge boost for our family and, and certainly my mom from a personal perspective. Absolutely. I think testimonies like that um, really speak to kind of the ground level truth of how affordable housing is important. Um, you know, even even just hearing things like that can be really useful when when thinking about education um, and how to you know remind folks why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's that's really great to hear. I'm I'm very happy for your mom um, that she's in a good spot. Uh, Ryan, I see you're on phone now. I think we might be able to hear you. Yes, I think I got that figured out. I'm sorry about that. No, no worries. So I, um, I want to thank everybody. This is a great, um, a lot of learning for me. So I appreciate it. Um, I am a, a resident of North Iowa, but also own the uh, 
parcel right at the corner of uh, you know 121 Route 1A, which I think was a controversial site for a proposed um, uh, subsidized housing or something uh, several years back that uh, caused quite a bit of uproar. And um, so now as the owner of that property, I want to do something with a mixed development there or something like that. I think the question I have is, you know, um, what resources are there for me? I mean, the, the hardest part is getting things off the ground and getting the development th tools in place. Um, you know, after that, I think that things kind of move pretty quickly. My first development was in Raynham and I did a medical building there and I had a great vision for that building. So I kind of knew what I wanted to do, but I had uh, Richie McCarthy was actually there at the time and he helped me a lot with uh, navigating some of the, um, uh, you know, things that uh, were available to help uh, get things off the ground in terms of track structures and things of and that nature. Um, and that was more from a business perspective, but uh, it was a commercial building, not a uh, residential. But I think that's the biggest, you know, coming from someone who would be, you know, bringing something from the other side, you know, actually trying to develop something. Those are the, those are the things that, that I see are my needs, right? I need help, um, you know, the financial cost of getting developments and and ideas in place, you know, that the, the so, all the soft cost, cost quote unquote, to to bring something to the table are, are some of the most expensive things. And I don't know what uh, what resources are available for that. So I just thought I'd put that question out. Thanks. For sure. Um, we're, let's just go in order. So we'll do Dan, then we'll do Marie, then we'll do Bill. Um, I'm sure everyone has feedback on that. Yeah, Ryan, there's a lot of uh, resources out there. Uh, you hear the the term CHAPA being sent out, you might want to write this down, chapa.org. Uh, it's a, uh, a group of housing developers and housing organizations, including housing authorities. Uh, and we're all about affordable housing. Then you can team up with mass housing. Uh, and that's where the finest stuff comes in. But uh, that in conjunction with your own town planner, with our own Lyle, uh, will give you the great boost and, and uh, those are your, your three big resources that I can I can point to. Excellent, I, I agree 100%. Um, kick it to Marie and then to Bill. Well, I, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, Lyle and, and Gil will be your main resources. And, and of course, if you want to come talk to the planning board, you're more than welcome anytime, but I think Chap and, and Lyle and Gil will, will uh, take care of that for you. Excellent. Yeah, if I could just jump in, there are specific state programs, and I think Bill's about to say this, uh, to, to enable affordable housing. And the town and the uh, developer have to work together on them. If, if you come in to planning and see Gil and me, we'd be glad to work with you on it. Yeah, Bill, I was going to cold call you because I know we've talked extensively about um, some of the uh, level of opaqueness in the zoning, so go for it. Yeah, no, I was going to make a couple of points. <laughs> the last three people said uh, pretty much what I was going to say about Gill and, and Lyle as a good resource. But, um, you know, that site in particular, I actually have intimate knowledge of because uh, it was actually one of my clients who was going to put up 24 townhouses under a 40B scheme because I believe, and it may still be, that property is in two zones. Uh, one portion residential, one portion commercial. So that was kind of their only option. And the neighbors came out and they pretty much had that negative connotation that, you know, it was going to be public housing and they just didn't understand what it, what it really was about. So, you know, I, I think the best advice is to just tap into the people that are in town, in the town offices, and they can, you know, help direct you in the, in the right direction. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That there's mixed, there's, dual zoning on that site and that was the issue they had to go in for a uh, zoning variance to get what they wanted and it turned into a fiasco right because at that time we had the previous form of government and the rezoning was shot down gil did you want to speak to that yeah, yeah i'll just add to that ryan i think there's a lot of nonprofits that specialize in creating affordable housing that they have uh, experience in knowing what forms, uh, what needs to be certified and so forth, that uh, you can reach out to and, and other developers and ask, uh, you know, what their tips are. Uh, back to the original question on how we could kind of spread the word of affordable housing. I think getting uh, local community groups is important, like uh, the Council on Aging, maybe they could expand certain programs, uh, Mails on Wheels, or, or just certain local 
community groups that can provide services and, and kind of create a community um, and a network of affordable housing, I think is very important and we could strive to do. Yeah, 100%. Um, I just want to comment, Ryan, it's really great to kind of have the other side of the coin perspective on this. Um, we as planners often talk about kind of getting to the point, but it's nice to hear from um, the folks who actually like really do the nitty gritty work and, and get us there. Um, so it's it's really useful to have your input. And, um, you know, we encourage you to kind of stay involved in this if you can. Um, it's just very helpful for us. Yeah, also, Taylor, well, if I, 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 I was if I can just say, I just want to say thank you to all of you so far for that feedback. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll try to do what I can. It, it, I think the toughest part is getting the project, uh, you know, off the ground. Once 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 the concept is there and approved, the rest kind of falls in place nicely. But the, it's all the early stage stuff that makes it really difficult. <clears throat> it makes the property sit and be unsightly for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So any help appreciated. So thank you very much. For sure. Uh, yeah, uh, Taylor, uh, back to... Um ways to communicate. I've talked that this town is very heavily Catholic and I've talked to Father <laughs> Thibault about affordable housing and he's he's a believer. <laughs> he's not only a believer but he likes affordable housing so I think one of the ways that we can um, get the word out is to ask for him to you know do something with the, that services, hand out leaflets or Mm -hmm. allow one of us to speak or something like that. And we would, I think they have three or four masses on a weekend. So if one of us would be willing to dedicate a weekend, then I think we could get the word out to a large portion of the population. Yeah, for sure. I think um, that's kind of speaks to Gil's point of like, there's a multitude of community groups that would be um, great starting points and, you know, perhaps taking an inventory of all of those different groups that you have in town and, uh, you know, that, that multi-level approach could be really useful um, that Marie was talking about, but I'm going to kick it to Marie anyways. So. I was just going to uh, elaborate on that and say that you're right. We do have many civic and other forms of other local organizations. I think this would be a nice task for the master plan committee to have a meeting and just brainstorm and figure out the number of organizations that we're aware of that we think would participate, how we would do that and then organize it. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, and that can be great to include not only just in the master plan, but in the housing production plan as um, kind of some of the priorities and the ways in which we can outline tasks to um, accomplish these goals. Okay. So, all right, I, we're past eight o'clock. Um, it's 8.07. I'm happy to continue. I think we have the Zoom booked until 8.30 if folks still have um, other points of discussion. Um, and if if not, we can and cordially, but it's up to folks what they're thinking. If anyone has any other comments they wanted to make. Just thank you all, extremely insightful and a great presentation. Thank you for coming. Uh, we've got Gil and then we've got Cheryl. Cheryl, you could go first. Thanks, Gil. I just want to say uh, from being at the end of all of this, being in the assessor's office, it's been pretty interesting hearing how it all starts. And then it ends, you know, once everything's said and done is, is where we see it. So it's been pretty interesting hearing it from the beginning part of it. Excellent. It was very, thank you. Thank you. Back to Gil. <laughs> Does anyone else have any more questions or comments? No, okay. No, I'd just like to say, I think we're working on one goal is a, um, you know, a it's been said publicly at, previous planning board meetings is um, a mixed use overlay. And I think housing will be a component of that, uh, how we can make it friendlier in the bylaws, more readable, identifiable, um, and you know how we can incentivize and blend in uh, residential with commercial uses and make it easier to develop affordable housing. So I think uh, in the near future, we will work on a, a mixed use overlay. And I think that is a key strategy to develop more uh, friendly or affordable housing, perhaps much easier that would uh, you know require less space to develop or be more flexible. Uh, and I think that's very important. So we are working on that in the near future and keep um, posted on it, please. Yeah, I'm really excited to kind of see the outcome of that, Gil. Um, I encourage folks, you know, 
as something like that proceeds and as we talk about zoning uh, changes, you know, writ large, that we kind of come back to this idea of looking at these different development examples. And, you know, we're not just talking about these seven. Uh, it could just be anything that you've seen. Um, I think it's probably going to be helpful, not just for us as the, the planners, but for town staff to, um, to know what folks would like to see, how they'd like it to look at what scale, um, you know, because it will, it can be all written into that bylaw. Um, and that makes, you know, the process a lot friendlier, like Gil was saying, and a lot more straightforward, not just for the developers, but um, for residents to look at the end product and it be something that they think looks really great. So unless anyone has anything else, um, I think we're good to, uh, to call it. Uh, Lyle, I see you've unmuted, what's up? Yeah, no, I just wanted to let you know that the ghost of Stan Musial just called me and said the first pitch is about to be thrown, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, I, I gotta, get, I gotta, I'm Priorities. sorry, gone over. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, so again, that's the story map presentation is in the chat. Um, this recording will be on YouTube. It'll be on the project website. It'll be on North TV, all sorts of different venues if you want to watch it again or show it to someone who uh, might want to watch it and provide comment. We encourage folks to get in, uh, in contact with us, the, the project team, with town staff, um, fill out the comment card, even, you know, if you feel comfortable using this uh, mapping exercise, if you have an idea of a specific site, um, you know, throw, throw a pin on there or give a like to some of these other comments that have already been made. But yeah, we just, we want to hear from folks however they most feel comfortable. Um, we're readily available and we're on Facebook, so Give us, give us a like, give the town a like. Uh, you can stay up to date with things going, going forward. It'd be really great. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming out today. It's been a great presentation. I've been very happy um, to, to be able to give this to everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Good night, thank folks. you guys. Good night. Thanks, y'all. Okay, good night. good night. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.